Attention listeners, ahead are spoilers. There is me, that is Russell, and my two droogs, that is Chris Boroff. Yarbles, Bolshe, great Yarblockos to thee and thine. And that is Zach Powers. Always horror show to vidi a picture with you, me droogs. And we were sitting around the Karova movie trap, trying to make our resu docs about what to do with the episode. We thought we would sharpen ourselves up for a bit of the old ultraviolence. Uh, welcome to the movie trap. Um, uh, if you have not seen this show again, this is a kind of a weird time to start because this is the third round. Basically how the show works is that one of the three hosts you just met picks a theme and then each of us picks a movie based on that theme. Uh, at the After we've watched all three movies, we then vote with our allocated amount of points plus bonus points that we earn along the way to see which movie wins and then that host picks the next theme. However, this will be a little bit different because we are uh, beginning our now traditional um, Halloween theme. So stay tuned for that uh, fun hijinks. I gotta say, uh, Russell, that was a very succinct description occasually I occasionally i find them a little uh thank you disjointed I that was yeah, quite succinct. i, I practiced this time I, I i noticed too that uh it was a bit messy uh in the past couple episodes so uh i will get my <laughs> proverbial shit together as mm-hmm. they say uh anyway so previously on the movie trap um we wa- we are in the middle of Zach Powers' theme, Movies That You Liked in High School. We watched uh, Chris Borov's pick, 1977's Sorcerer. And now it is befall to me in round three, the final one where we will- Oh, and my pick, which, which was these... uh, 1992's Reservoir Dogs. Right, that, that, yeah, that we already, yeah. And then Reservoir Dogs. So now we're doing On Mine for Clockwork Orange, uh, 1971, directed by Stanley Kubrick. Uh, if you're a big fan of movies, I'm pretty sure you've seen this one before. This is a very good chance. Um, yeah. Um, so before we get into the, uh, you know, Beethoven uh, love affair, let's uh, get a rundown of the pointy points. Uh, I, Russell, have one more bonus point to give out with 11 points at final voting. Chris Boroff, you are out of points. He shot his wad with Reservoir Dogs. Um and he has 14 points to vote on because Zach Powers gave him a lot on Sorcerer. And Zach, you have one more point to give out with 12 points for final voting. Okay. Okie dokie. So uh, with that in mind, Zach, let's, uh, let's roll up our sleeves and, and get into the, 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 the real horror show of A Clockwork Orange. A Clockwork Orange is a 1971 Stanley Kubrick film starring Malcolm McDowell, based on the novel by Anthony Burgess. Uh, It takes place in a not-too-distant semi-dystopian England, um, in which crime has spiraled out of control and tells the story of young uh, 17-year-old Alex DeLarge, um, a delinquent and sort of leader of a small gang of four who uh, nightly goes out and commits random acts of violence. Alex is a sadist and a sociopath by pretty much any metric you could, uh, you could measure. Um, The first chunk of the film is uh, Alex and his friends or droogs as they call them in NADSAT, the sort of Cockney rhyming slang esque. Uh, Russian hybrid that uh, Russian Burgess, hybrid inv- that they he Burgess in. invented. There's a glossary yeah. at the end of the book. Um, uh, they do various things. They uh, beat an old man for no reason. Um, you know, they find a rival gang and beat the living hell out of them. Um, they run into the country, uh, driving cars off the road, and uh, find a writer and his wife, um, Alex, uh, rapes the wife and the writer himself is beaten into being a cripple. Um, should say content warning. There's sexual assault in this one. Gonna be, uh, gonna be a thing. Um, uh, yeah. As, over the course of the next few days, um, there is a little bit of, uh, I guess, disharmony in Alex's group. We see his day-to-day life, how his parents don't know what he does and uh, there is a, sort of a probation officer who is wise to the fact that Alex is a hoodlum uh, that Alex uh, largely ignores. Um, PR Deltoid. Hi- PR Deltoid, Deltoid is the name of that character. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 
um, who grabs Alex's dick very forcefully at one point. Um, anyway, uh, eventually we come to find uh, after an orgy that Alex has or a threesome, uh, his his droogs are looking for uh, some some higher end crimes. They want to make a little bit more money. Um, and Alex uh, is not the biggest fan of them kind of thinking for himself and going off the rails. So he beats the shit out of a couple of them. Um, it's also worth noting at this point that Alex has a deep abiding love for Ludwig van, AKA mm-hmm. Beethoven specifically owed to joy. Um, and the night symphony. Yeah. Yeah. The night symphony. Uh, but uh, after beating them up, he uh, abides to their plan anyway. They go out and find a rich, older woman in the countryside who they plan to rob. Um, in entering her house uh, through an open window, Alex bludgeons her uh, to death with a giant penis statue uh, before uh, his droogs, tired of being treated like shit, smash a milk bottle across his face and leave him for the police. Uh, At this point, he's incarcerated and sentenced to uh, 14 years for the murder of this woman. Uh, Two years into his prison term, um, there is a new technique coming around uh, in Britain. Uh, The Ludovico technique? Ludovici? Ludovico. Ludovico, yeah. yeah, okay. Uh, which is theoretically a way to rewire somebody's brain um, so that they have a complete aversion to murder and sex crimes and anything of that nature. Uh, And Alex, desperate to cut his sentence short, uh, agrees to sign up and in fact goads the Minister of the Interior into getting him uh, on this technique where they take him to a facility where they hold his eyes open with clamps and force him to watch horrible videos of violence and sex crimes while Beethoven's ninth plays in the background after injecting him with a drug that causes him to become horribly sick and feel like he's dying. And the mental association means eventually after two weeks of this torture, basically he is completely unable to engage in violence or maybe all sex, but definitely non-consensual sex uh, of any kind. Uh, Additionally, he can no longer hear Beethoven's Ninth Symphony without becoming extremely sick and wanting to die. Uh, uh, He's freed, and the remainder of the film is Alex seeing various people from his life before he was sent to prison. He first goes to his parents' house, where they find they have rented the room uh, that he used to live into a new new person who has functionally become their son. Uh, They turn him out on the streets in favor of Joe, their new surrogate son. Uh, On the streets, he is beaten by the tramp uh, that he saw at the beginning and his friends, only to be rescued by two of his former droogs, now police officers, who take him to the countryside and uh, almost drown him um, before sending him to walk home Uh, He, uh, in a rainstorm and obviously very badly beaten and hurt, finds a house in the countryside, um, but quickly realizes it belongs to the writer that he had crippled before, uh, whose wife has since committed suicide. But fortunately, in that uh, endeavor, they had worn masks, so the writer does not recognize him and is sympathetic to Alex's plight, thinking the new technique is a form of torture and strips men of their free will um, and takes him in, gives him a bath and a meal. But while he's in the bath, Alex begins to sing, singing in the rain, the same song he sung when he crippled that man and raped his wife tipping him off to the fact that this is indeed, indeed the same person who victimized him years before. So uh, as revenge, he poisons his food and locks Alex in an upstairs room. Uh, having learned that he has an aversion to Beethoven's ninth, he blasts it through the house. So Alex feels sick and like he wants to die, uh, unable to escape the room. Alex decides to kill himself, jumping through the second story window uh, onto the pavement below. He wakes up later in the hospital and finds his aversion to violence and sex 
has disappeared as a result of the injury. Um, the uh, Minister of the Interior comes by and Alex, having been his big guinea pig for this new program, um, now suffering terribly, says, we'll give you a good job and take care of you if you just help me with my re-election campaign. And they make a big PR stunt out of it. And it ends with Alex fantasizing about having sex with a woman in front of a crowd of sort of adoring, uh, wealthy gentlemen yeah, and like saying, Victorian I was indeed and cured. I um, was cured. All right. Yeah, yeah okay. I was cured. All right. Mm. One, one question. And that on is that. a clockwork orange. One question on that. Was it a suicide or did he say something about she caught the flu and passed? <laughs> The writer mentions oh, pneumonia. Oh, uh, he didn't commit suicide. Yeah, she she died of some sickness, but the writer believes that He's, it was it's because a of, result of the assault. Of the... Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, um, yeah. Not a fun movie, you know. I mean, it's it's well, it's, there's it's a great parts. movie. It's yeah. a great movie, but it is. I I I guess I should. I'll, I'll open it with why I picked this movie. Uh, considering that I was sure. in high school and probably a pretty impressionable age uh, were I not raised uh, to not be a sociopath or not have, you know, murderous, rapey tendencies. Uh, this movie could have been rather dangerous uh, to somebody of my age. Uh, mm -hmm. But I was still fascinated because uh, one of the reasons why I wanted to watch it when I was younger, because there are, a, there were exactly two movies that my mom absolutely prevented me from watching, and for it was *Verboten*, was uh, *The Exorcist*, which I of course watched, and it was pretty disappointed. And then uh, this movie. These, according to her, these are the only two movies that literally made her sick. And with a movie like *A Clockwork Orange*, I fucking get it. Um, however, when I watched it, I remember I had to sneak down because it was on like HBO or something, so I had to videotape it back then. And uh, I remember. I, it was like two in the morning or whatever and I was sneaking down there to uh, to make sure it was running and I saw it was the scene where Alex reconfronts his parents after he meets the, the lodger or whatever so I thought like okay this is just going to be like a, a drama you know it's going to be like a <laughs> I know, would, I would I, rooms. you know you said um, deeply unpleasant briefly that's one of the most comedic scenes in the entire fucking movie <laughs> I don't know I think the I, I think watching the, the penis smashing is it plays a little funnier now to me than it did back then. I, I think, think I was more it's... confused about it back then. But I literally we could let the, you the, the, the we could let you finish shot, your... when I finally got you know when it finally all recorded. I was so excited. I run home from school and I put it on, I, and and that opening dirge of the soundtrack and then Alex's face with that iconic grin out, and yeah. The, yeah I mean it's it's such a it, I thought it was going to be a horror movie that's literally what I thought that this movie was going to be and it kind of is it kind yeah of I didn't is mention a his genre movie. Because this movie like, is difficult to yeah, typify it is it, because it's also because if you listen to Malcolm McDowell Malcolm McDowell he claimed that we, he thought we were shooting a dark comedy um, and it kind of plays like that in some respects. It kind of like the violence. Yeah. The, I'm speaking specifically of the the fight between the Droogs and the rival gang. Like it's almost like a professional wrestling event. There, there's nothing. Oh, I mean, it's him. blunt and in your face, but it's also very kind of over the top goofy and, and cartoony. Yeah, it's yeah. silly. Well, it's like stage violence. Like that's one of the things yeah. that I noticed that a couple times in this, there were odd moments where they have a lot of proscenium shots or things mm -hmm. that are set in like a square where people enter frame and then leave frame and then they come like, you know, towards camera and away from camera. But with scenes like that and at the end when he was doing the presentation sequence, like both of them have like a single light uh, aimed at stage. So like when mm -hmm. he's going in to fight all the dudes with all the droogs, it's like a blast light that's just kind of filling up the whole thing. It's not traditionally lit where everything's on. And then they kind of call back to that at the end with that. but. Uh, it definitely felt like a black comedy to me, like really, really black comedy. Like, like, yeah, like black I, I, I mirror, get that. Yeah, black mirror probably owes a great deal of its uh, cultural cachet to things like this. Even oh, I even think there's the original, a great deal of films that owe a lot to a Clockwork Orange. Uh, even the original Sorcerer. trailer is like uh, flashes words on the screen while you watch the trailer, and they're like funny comic horrifying thriller political metaphorical like it's all this different shit that like is often deeply contradictory and i think it's because this movie is kind of all those things it is and i think it's also it's vintage kubrick isn't it i mean because yeah. one of his superpowers is keeping the audience at arm's length 
Um, you know, he, you know, it, the, the way the cameras are and the way the blocking is, like, you as an audience member are so far removed from everything that's happening as far as connecting with any anybody, any of the characters as actual people. Um, and also, I think that uh, Malcolm McDowell even said in the when when they re, when they re-released the Blu-ray for the 40th anniversary, where this movie's now 50 years old. But he said he watches it with on, modern audiences now, and they laugh a lot more than they did back in the 70s. I'll bet they do. Yeah. Um, and I'll, and and you know he the the anchor or whatever asked him why do why do you think that is? And and I think Malcolm McDowell said it right. Well, A Clockwork Orange was released, and it kind of changed everything. Like that's what's different is that Clockwork Orange is out now, yeah, and everybody. This seen is it. this is. Uh, when I watched this movie and realized it was 50 years old, I was a little surprised. Maybe it's just because I'm, when I think of movies that are 50 years old and it's just 50 this year, I still think like it's going to be something that's a little more staid, a little more quiet. It's not going to have this level of like mm -hmm. controversy or sexual violence or regular violence or experimentation. It's going to be something that's a little more traditional and it's weird this was at the forefront of that like Wild West film 70s thing. And yep. realizing that that era is turning 50 was very strange. Mm -hmm. Well, it was people like tossing off the haze code mostly. Like they were yeah. stuck with that for a long time. And even after it wasn't like enforced, people were still like, you know, playing it safe a lot of the times so and not doing anything really shocking. But. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, there. It's always weird like that when you watch an old movie and then there'll be something where you're like, oh, that's way more direct than I thought. Like, uh, I can't remember. There was like a pre Hayes Code film that we had to watch in Howie, like not Babyface, so that one was intense too. Oh, there was, there another, was one. A, another one. Uh, yeah, un, I can't remember. Un, what un it was. film Un Chien en Delu. I think that one was I, strange. Oh, un Chien en Delu is an yeah. experimental well, film. I think yeah. it's most famous for a shot of an eye getting cut yeah. open. Yeah. But I don't know that that had any Hayes Code uh, worries in terms no, of... No, it didn't. Like, Salvador it, Dali helped make that movie. But it was but it was because of the time period. Like, it's so old. Right. It's very shot. It's very surprising yeah. to see sex, for example, like, portrayed in that fashion, where it's like mm -hmm. the guy's acting like a monster and he's foaming at the mouth, which is kind of a funny <laughs> sequence. But it's one of those things. Like, it's We so laughed direct. at the time. Yeah, I mean, it's so direct. It's like, oh, oh, God, okay. I guess, yeah, they would have had sex and violence every era. So it's just, we haven't gotten used but to seeing it on screen. It is, you know, this is 10 years, this is 10 years after Psycho. Like, and yeah. I like Psycho. I think Psycho is a great movie, but like comparing this and Psycho. Or, or even, it's even, what, three years away from The Wild Bunch. You know, and the yeah. Wild Bunch was, I think, way more violent than this movie, um, yeah. as far as body count is concerned. But the thing yeah. about the violence in this movie is it's not necessarily what you see, it's what you, it's going on in your fucking head as an audience member. Um, because I, I believe, you know, unlike the Wild Bunch, uh, I think the thing about the violence in A Clockwork Orange is I think the violence is the point. Uh, yeah. It's about violence. Uh, by way of punishment, violence by way of reform, violence by way of revenge, and also forcing you, the audience, to admit your own capacity for violence, um, or at least to forgive a very violent creature. You go one way or another, because the movie forces you almost for, to feel sorry for Alex. Yeah, it does. Um, and you don't want bad shit to happen to him after when you damn well know that he's going to do horrible shit if given his own devices yeah par uh, paradoxically at the end it's almost like a happy ending when he like gets yeah. his groove back and you're like oh yeah. wait he doesn't he shouldn't be back out there yeah and that's why i think this this had such the reaction to it to its violence even though i i'm under the impression that a wasn't as violent as it could have been and certainly there are contemporary films around it that are more violent but i think it's the way that it sticks with the audience that shocked people and yeah. that's what made it, it, it seem more violent than it actually and it's, is. because yeah. in that respect it is it, it messes with you this movie's a bad acid trip um, um you know it's it's yeah i i mean it's a, yeah it's definitely i mean we'll talk about how heavily stylized it is in both dialogue and 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 aesthetic but um you know even like the source material Burgess's novel, like it's different, like a little bit. Uh, a lot of the beats are the same. Alex is 15 instead of 17 in that, which is wild uh, at the beginning of the story. Um, but Burgess, like a Burgess's wife was actually raped by like some people and oh, wow. died, like lost a baby. American um, GIs and yeah. specifically drunken American GIs. 
Holy yeah. shit, yeah. And I think because that's why the writer character, he even said, like, I base that off of me. You know, oh, the writer a, a... in the book is writing a book called A Clockwork Orange. Yeah, the metafictional thing. Uh, yeah. yeah with... um, but yeah, it, and, and that book, uh, even Burgess in that book is actually against this treatment that strips people of free will for these people who are like represent representative of the people who caused such horrible things to happen in his own life. But it has a chapter where Alex reforms of his own accord at the end, Correct. Correct. which was not released in the American versions of right. the novel. Uh, Kubrick found out about it later and was like, well, I'm not doing I that. I didn't care. Yeah, that's yeah. Right. he did. And honestly, I think it's the right choice because yeah. uh, basically the last chapter is Alex goes back to his old droogie ways as a whole new batch of droogs. Um, and then he meets the uh, other droog who is not involved with the coup against Alex, Pete. And Pete's like a, you know, like a regular guy now. He's got a wife and kids. And that's when Alex realizes that he needs to grow up. And that's basically the end of the movie. And I, I think that's like, boy, you're kind of letting everything off the hook with that last chapter. Like you're just kind of let, well, see, all I needed to do was realize you need a loving wife and family and, and yeah. Alex will be okay. And I, it yeah. seemed to uh, seem pretty hackneyed to me. It seems and, pretty and I get, Yeah. And, and also, why, yeah, like- And uh, it's not the movie that Kubrick was interested in telling. I mean, clearly. That, that Alex doesn't seem like he'd make for a great parent, in my opinion. <laughs> no. Well, I mean, uh, I, uh, I'm not, it's interesting to me because like Kubrick, we always kind of, or at least I've always associated him with like severely changing novels when he adapts them. Like, you know, The Shining, the movie is way different than the book, but this one seems pretty close. Like what are the actual differences between the book and this? Cause I know that they're like, minute. The they're minute. Like, yeah, yeah. They're like, okay. So like, instead of uh, Dim and Georgie being cops, it's the old gang that he beat up at the beginning. They're the cops now rather than his mm. old droogs. That's one change that comes to the top of my mind. It, but I mean, to, I mean, Stanley Kubrick, according to Malcolm McDowell, Stanley Kubrick gets writing credit on this, but they basically just walked around with the novel and just set up scenes that way. That's, that's how, mm. and then they would change things pretty much on the fly. Uh, that's mm. why it, in a very old interview from like the 1970s where they're interviewing Malcolm McDowell and, uh, and Burgess, um, uh, Malcolm McDowell said like he, Kubrick has this reputation of being very rigid and very, you know, perfectionist. And he is in their sect, but he's actually very fluid. For example, I think the most iconic part, and I think one of the reasons that it gets to people Second is the singing most in the iconic, rain. But yeah. Is the singing in the rain bit. And that was totally kind of Malcolm McDowell's doing. They yeah. were running that scene over, it just wasn't working. So Stanley Kubrick suggested Malcolm McDowell just do a little, you know, do a little soft shoe. And he's like, okay, sure. And they just started doing doobie doobie doo and just started singing, singing in the rain. And Kubrick had the cachet at the time. Within three hours, he had the rights of the song. I'll bet Gene Kelly very much regrets that. Um, uh, he famous Malcolm McDowell said he once met, uh, was introduced to Gene Kelly at a party years later and Gene Kelly just turned around and walked away and didn't Couldn't even, even look at him. Yeah. Respond to him. Yeah. Sorry. I mean, I, 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 I also heard Gene Kelly's kind of an asshole. Oh yeah. He's a, oh, he's a tyrant. <laughs> I mean, no, no. one thing he has in common with Stanley Kubrick, he's a tyrant on set. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and, and again, this is, this is colored by Malcolm McDowell's portrayal. And as I understand it, if you're Stanley Kubrick played favorites, right? If you were the main character for what he viewed as he would, do everything and coddle you. If you weren't, you pretty much were more or less a prop or a pawn. He, he had he, Stanley Kubrick is not known for his uh, humanity. Um, yeah, there's obviously there's a lot of famous stories about the making of The Shining, but sure. we can leave those aside because yeah. we're not and, talking and he, about that movie. And even this one, even Clockwork Orange. I mean, like it's it's lucky that Malcolm McDowell was playing Alex because the guy oh. was very brave and and this... when it was full gusto. And this it's is one of his first movies. You know, on the famously unpleasant for mcdowell like his during the what i would consider the most famous scene in this movie the eyeball scene, the, the actual corneas. scene where he's watching the films uh his cornea was like badly scratched caused him a lot of pain um even though they had like a real doctor there to administer those eye drops yeah um, but he freaked out and scratched uh, i mean yeah, i can't really that. blame him no hell no <laughs> I mean, imagine uh, even, even yeah, you have a doctor pouring eye drops on you, but that doesn't feel, I mean, picture that. And you're doing it, how long does these setups take? You know, like four hours? You're like that for four hours, mm. just sitting there looking up and just these puddles of water singing on and you? That would drive anybody crazy. The scene where he, there's an uncut shot when the droogs get a hold of him again, where they try to, they almost drown him. 
Um, now there was a tank hidden in that uh, trough of water, oxygen tank, but apparently at the time it was frigid, frigid, frigid England winter, and it was freezing fucking cold. Like that that scene was apparently like torturous to film as well. I'll bet. And 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 to Malcolm McDowell's credit, he's pretty much spent his whole career defending this movie. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, because unlike you know, it's funny because uh, we were. W- when I thought about Reservoir Dogs and we were talking about how, uh, you know, Tarantino was kind of let off the hook with a lot of his homophobia and racism. This movie was not let off the hook. Kubrick got heaps of shit for this movie. Yeah. Um, you know, to, to the point of death threats where he had to pull it from the United Kingdom for almost like 30 years. Well, there was like accounts of for, people for which part? literally doing, death. oh, well, people, there were crimes that seemed to be very clearly in- clearly inspired to the degree that people were like singing singing in the rain while they would do the press would call them clockwork crimes you know uh yeah like they were they were the the degree of inspiration was like difficult to you know and realistically these are people who i believe probably would have done crimes anyway correct well there's some modern examples of that let me let me i think it's it's like there's a line in Scream where one of the killers says, movies don't make psychos, movies make psychos more creative. Hmm. I think it's like that. Hmm. Yeah, I think these are just I, people I kinda, who are going to do this shit. I'd anyway. agree with hmm. that. Yeah, and, and that's, a, you know, and, and considering how uh, blunt a clockwork orange is, I kind of, I mean, the police are the ones who advise him that, like, really, you're getting very serious death threats. And like, he was shooting Barry Lyndon at the time. People were outside of his house protesting. Yeah. Oh, I mean, yeah. from what I understand it, when the British get into a mob, uh, it's unstoppable. And they are fer- they are feverish with it. And Clockwork Orange just set up this panic. And at the same time a Clockwork Orange came out, we were getting out of the 60s, right? So you did have this kind of untamed youth, so sure. to speak, uh, MST3K First. reference. Uh, they're, uh, they, so this movie is kind of like an, not really an answer to it, but almost even, like letting you know that this wave of violence even in is coming. America, this movie was X-rated. It's one of two X-rated movies to be uh, nominated for Best Picture in the history of the Academy Awards. The other being uh, Urban Cowboy. Mid, um, Midnight, Cow- Midnight Cowboy. Midnight Cowboy. Yeah, I'm sorry. Not My mistake. Cowboy. Ur- Urban Cowboy. Yeah, Midnight I think Cowboy. is the uh, John Travolta. That's the, the John Travolta thing. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah, yeah. I meant Midnight Cowboy. Yeah. I misspoke. Um, but I think this one deserves it more. Um, it's. Um, but even by. T- but I don't think you know if it came out today. I'll say this: the degree of shocking this would be was, like the on-screen violence is not super bad by modern standards. I think the build up to the sexual assault, which happens off screen, is pretty jarring, but the actual violence is pretty tepid. I mean, if you've seen, I mean, there's a lot of movies nowadays, like Midsummer. like if you've seen some of the violence in that movie, sure, this don't hold a candle. Sure, yeah. and, and I, but also I think that part of that reason is because A Clockwork Orange was released. Sure. Yeah. You know, I think that this movie, for better or worse, is a pivot point. There yeah. is a time before Clockwork Orange and a time after a Clockwork Orange. Um, well, and I, I always and find I think this that that, like sure. super weird though, because it's like you have violence in this movie, and then by the time you get to the '80s, I was like a six-year-old being taken to like Total Recall and stuff like that, where it's super sure. violent and it's super intense, and it's like at what point? It seems like there was a point where people were just like, violence is okay for kids to see now. And it was like sometime in the 80s, like Predator and Alien and Aliens and all that. And it got way more intense. And Rambo, it depends, because there's obviously violence is, uh, it's very dependent on what you're seeing. Like there's violence, like I just described in Midsummer, And then there's like itchy and scratchy trauma <laughs> shit. <laughs> and like, they are not made equal necessarily. Like no. there is... 
Yeah. No, and that's why this this movie's violence is there is no equal because as I was mentioning earlier, it's it's the what the psychological effect that has on you, the audience member, mm. and the fact that it what that must do, that that affects people to have to root for this monster, um, yeah. to feel bad and sympathetic. Yeah. And to Malcolm McDowell's credit, he does know how to shift it to. I mean, it, what a hard role to play to find any semblance of humanity in this creature. You know, uh, and he does it. Like there's that one when he first gets slapped in the demonstration that he can't do any violence anymore the the look on his face and the way he talks is like why did you do that brother i've done know you wrong as if like you motherfucker really you like what you just beat the shit out of a homeless guy just because you were annoyed at his singing i, I don't even think it was because of that i think he just thought it was funny i just thought yeah uh, right. um but uh, i think that you know what it reminds me of a little bit in that regard this like sort of sympathy for the devil aspect or actually i think that the thing is like I think that we are supposed to understand that Alex is a monster and this treatment is almost more monstrous and its potential and its delivery and all these things. Like Burgess famously said in an interview that he wouldn't subject even Adolf Hitler to this kind of treatment because it's just like so devastatingly dehumanizing. I don't know if I agree For with sure. that necessarily. Um, I, I'm kind of with you, but but I, I I will say in terms of humanizing a monster, it reminds me a little bit uh, in that regard of um, you. Probably, this is a you guys went to film school of uh, of M if you've seen it. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure, yeah, sure. Like certainly that character is yep. fucking horri horrifying, and by the end you do have sympathy for him. Um, sure, I'm curious. When I was in high school, um, how I encountered this was, uh, I mean, I already kind of knew about the movie, but they had us watch it in psychology class. <laughs> okay. Of, it was a thing you could sign off for and then like- Okay, yeah, yeah, to get a, a waiver from your parents yeah, 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 and shit, yeah. got it, and yeah. They, I can't remember, I think they might've cut one or two scenes out, I can't remember. But the thing is, is I was wondering um, when, did you guys like run into this as children? Cause for me, it was because of like high school and they were like, okay, so it's the Skinner box, behavioralism, uh, taste aversion, stuff like that. And then kids would have to write an essay on it. Yeah. I was just being a snot nosed yeah. kid who just said, you can't tell me what to do mom. And I was 14 and I, I, and again, I thought it was a monster movie and it pretty much was. That's why I, I thought it would be a cool idea to dress as Alex from a clockwork orange. And plus nobody in my age group had ever heard of this movie. So I was super, super cool. Oh, uh, I, uh, I guess I was about, uh, it was sometime while I was in high school. I think I've only seen this once before, honestly. Mm. So it's been a long, long time. Um, it's been a and, long time since I've seen it too. Uh, I just, I was that age where I was like seeking out movies like this. Like I was, um, I, I chose, I chose Reservoir Dogs because I think it was one of the, like, maybe the first one that, like, I saw that I was like, this type of movie, like, it's not like a genre, but it's like a, a white suburban high school boy is going to have, like, this thing, this genre, right? Sure. I, and Clockwork Orange is somewhere in there. And I was exploring that genre and I came across Clockwork Orange. And I don't remember specifically the first time seeing it. I truly don't. Do you think um, it's like a safe transgression when you're young? It's something that you aren't really supposed to be doing, but then you watch it anyway. And then, you know, do you I know think, what I mean? Uh, I think if you, I, I think for most people, um, if you're a teenager of that age and you're watching like, sort of more challenging movies like this um or darker i guess you could say like more edgy it's usually safe as long as you don't get stuck with them for the rest of your life if you don't you got to be over it by the time you're like 20 by the time you're 20 you got to be a little more over it but i think it's a pretty safe transgression i think the worst case scenario is you become a bit of a douchebag but i don't think I, like I it's went to, to Columbine High movie. School, you know, and they blamed a lot of shit on a lot of culture. Like the Matrix was a Marilyn fucking. Manson, yeah. I don't Doom. believe any of that yeah. shit. I yeah. just don't. I don't buy it for a second. Those people mm -hmm. were fucked up before they saw the Matrix, if they ever saw it. Like, ain't nothing to do with that. 
So yeah. I don't know. Yeah, I, I, I just I, don't think I don't buy like this. We have to. I think if your kid and it happens for different kids at different ages, if they're mentally ready or able to handle a thing, fuck it, show it to them. Well, we were kind of talking about this during Say Anything, Boraf, you know, where you were saying that, like, this this movie doesn't necessarily encourage good behavior uh, from, you know, high school kids treating their girlfriends. It's kind of the same amount that, like, if you don't have the grounding uh, to be prepared to watch this movie, like, it, it, is this movie dangerous? A little bit. A little bit. Um, because... It does. It doesn't glorify the violence because I think when you glorify violence, you is when you don't show the consequences of it, and this one very much does, um, and even has those consequences inflicted upon Alex. Sure. Um, so, but because of its stylization, because of its uh, arty way, and and let's be honest, cool. I mean, like I the 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 look of Alex. Is this movie's stylish on, as fuck. Yeah, I mean, mm -hmm. it sticks with you. It is. It's a, iconic. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's it, it that first shot of him just doing the little grin and it just pulls back into the narration. Oh, yeah. I mean, it is. I mean, it, it makes your skin crawl. It. This it, is our it, second Kubrick movie, but like. Oh man. Yeah, man. It, when. I, if he if he wanted if he had an idea for a shot like. <sighs> There's so many beautiful moments in like every movie he made, even the ones that I'm not a particularly big fan of. Mm -hmm. And this one, you know, Brink's not not low. It's it's yeah. gorgeous. And that yeah, first it, shot is in fucking credible. It is, and yeah. it sets the whole tone of who Alex is and what world we're in. Because I wanted to ask you guys, like a part of the I, I think part of like the the stylistic comes from also like the art direction and stuff. So like you know, it, it, do you think that Kubrick or probably just Kubrick is sort of making a commentary about the over sexualization within culture? Because like even in the old lady, like she she's the one who owns that penis statue. It's not like Alex sure. brings it in with him. And there's pictures of naked ladies even in mom and dad's house. Like it seems sure, like it's sex constant. is at the forefront of everything. And do you think Kubrick's kind of commenting on that? uh saying that like part of why alex is the way he is i mean it's sort of like sarah it's sort of the hobbesian thing right is this nature or is this the, the uh, nurturing can, of society and ineffectual parents and you can contrast that to obviously in any time he's in a place that is very much of the state or institutional right like there it's very puritanical um by comparison uh, upright and proper, but even in those situations, they occasionally have, like the woman whose job is to come out come on the out stage, there naked, right? Just be naked, creepy part out. of the movie, and like I they mean, very calmly like observe this, uh, you know, well, as upright gentlemen. Oh man, I mean, I, it almost. And at the end, they kind of harness those two things together with Alex's fantasy like, yeah he is creating like he has this idea of a wild sex in front of these people who are of respectable class like and they're, that's how alex um, wins he becomes of the respectable class and finds a way to do his i don't know his uh, deviancy <laughs> in a respectable way or a way that is sanctioned by the state well this one it's i've heard this one talked about a few times because it seems like uh, anything that's male tends to be destructive in this movie um and uh i've noticed when watching it and you guys can correct me if i'm wrong but very few of the female characters have any sort of um depth outside of the mom i think um uh, and even it, then it's even that's well, kind of but it you guys have you guys heard the concept of the male gaze and all that yep yeah we have, sure. yeah i've seen it's the kind of the yeah, I mean, it's the thing that kind of like jumped out at me with this is that it's, you know, the male gaze is sort of destructive in its like presentation in this. Um, uh, yeah. And it's, that's why I'm saying, I, do you think that's a commentary that Kubrick did that intentionally, that he is sort of commenting on the male gaze and maybe that's what, it's the well, atmosphere that created sure. Alex. There's a lot of, I mean, there a lot of choice. spring from he, sex and violence. He didn't accidentally make a big dick statue yeah, yeah. or the graffiti and all that. Yeah, yeah I mean, it seems like violence, violence is, is the core, is, like, you know, uh, thread of it is like, it's mm -hmm. all that. Like, even, I don't think there was like any mm -hmm. normal art 
really. Like looking around on the walls, like most no. of the people had. It's it's pretty remarkable that most yeah. of this is on location. I, I it's, that's saying something about Kubrick. Um, but like I that's why I call this movie. This is his anti two thousand one, right? Because he makes this right after two thousand one, and he's pretty much can get away with anything at this point. He's got his own. So in between two thousand one and Clockwork Orange, Easy Rider, Graduate fucking midnight cowboy come out so i i think this is kubrick's kind of anti-2001 this is where i'm, I'm gonna make a low budget film about youth gone wild and this is the result um, um uh, i'll say something briefly about uh, obviously like there's a there's a lot of uh, female nudity and i think there is uh, objectification very in, often very intentionally like there are literally statues of bound women that they pour milk out of like mm -hmm. I, I think it's hard to argue that that's not somewhat intentional um but i will also say in terms of characters like you said there's not a lot of depth to these to most of the female characters in this like i outside of alex i think everybody's pretty slight like oh totally everybody's yeah. playing a type right i yeah. think like part of the reason i think if they really wanted to land home the dark comedy they should have just had all the side characters be played by monty python um because you uh, can you imagine john cleese as the prison guard he'd have been fucking great at it your toes belong well, on the other well, side I mean, of it they but they did that it was called brazil <laughs> that's true that's true that was only a little bit that, yeah, well, they, they, yeah they almost did you hear before kubrick was involved and they were thinking about making a movie version of yeah terry or, southern they considered having Mick Jagger Correct. and the Rolling Stones as the, Alex and the Drukes. Right, because the, the book itself is written in 1961, I believe. It published in 1962, yeah. but he wrote it in 1961. So somebody like Mick Jagger and the Rolling Stones sort of fit the type that I think Burgess was kind of going for, this kind of wild youth that we don't really understand. And they're kind of casting off the shackles of tradition or whatever and he's sort of imagining what that future so i kind of don't hate that casting choice i mean it would have been a way different movie and it kubrick even hit taylor southern who helped him with dr strangelove is the one who introduced him to the book and kubrick at first just sort of threw it aside didn't really care then he made 2001 and he read uh clockwork orange and he said this is actually the future that i actually kind of want to shoot you know because I, I, same with you 2001 isn't necessarily what i would call a, a humanist movie uh but there is much more of a of a endearing idea of human progress that's not as cynical as this movie is where this movie's wholly cynical about progress or any sort of reform um like one of the things i didn't actually catch on uh when i was younger but totally got this time around was the the whole political subtext and i'm not talking about like the mm -hmm. the comment on society but like there's a plot point about changes of government that was totally mm -hmm. lost on me when i was a kid and that's that's a, like a big thing so like it is this notion that like a conservative party is just as bad as a liberal party because the the author is supposed to be like this dissident writer or whatever uh to this kind of co conservative authoritarian government and yet he's still just as violent as alex even if you want to excuse it with its revenge and alex has it coming you're still excusing violence um so it is sort of uh that's yeah. what Cooper. i think it's i mean there's an inherent hypocrisy he knows that alex did in fact murder a woman yeah but when it becomes personal he elects to torture him instead of yeah. write this op-ed or whatever he's gonna right. fucking do yeah. write this book his op-ed yeah his book a <laughs> clockwork orange um yeah, yeah and that's why I, and i also think it's also this is the first attempt to do an orwellian kind of story in in cinema i i have like 1984 was written you know published in the early 50s late 40s and this is actually the first honest, genuine attempt, I think, to create that kind of Big Brother-esque dystopia. Do uh, You mentioned how cold and sort of uh, antiseptic a lot of Kubrick's films are. Uh, we talked about Nolan last week. Do you think he's more or less cold than uh, Nolan? Like, which one? Less, is... but not by much. Less, I would agree. But... I would agree. I would agree less. Yeah, do you think less, but not as much, because... Do you think that's why the violence feels so much more intense? Because it's just presented as a matter of fact thing and it's not made exciting. Outside of the uh, wrestling theatrics from the first attack, everything else seems pretty unpleasant and just portrayed as like, it's violence. Yeah. Uh... I don't know. I, I kind of think with the Clockwork Orange again, because both Nolan and, and Kubrick are very stylized when they do violence. But again, Nolan kind of relies on on shticks a lot you know like i'm gonna have a fight scene but it's gonna be in a revolving hallway see um whereas like you know you can't say in clockwork orange 
like one of the most bloody scenes in the whole thing is cutting of Dim's hand. And the only reason why that sticks out to you is because it's all in slow motion. Um, and that's sort of, I, I think Kubrick's a little bit more putting the audience at a distance than Nolan is. Nolan's trying to get you along for a ride. And I think Kubrick's I, uh, trying to punish you. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. I mean, it's so frequently, that's what I'm, we were talking about this earlier, but like the movie is scene to scene. It's, it's, it's amazing that it coheres so well, because I think scene to scene, I have very different reaction. We talked about that scene where he goes back and talks to his parents um, and they're like, we're putting you out of the house. The score on that scene is soap opera fucking music. Rosie. It's turned up to 11 mm -hmm. yep. and it's so over dramatic and the mom is crying. It, like it's satire. Yeah, that is I not know. a fucking drama exactly. scene. Are you kidding me? Yeah, that scene yeah. is comedy. Yep. Full I mean, stop. That, and, I'm, it's amazing it exists it. in the same scene as the assault of the writer because that yeah. scene like is not like that's dark again that was the first scene i saw of a clockwork orange and i'm like well i don't see what's so bad about this i don't know what's everyone's big deal <laughs> there's some scenes of real comedy some of the stuff in that sure. first the first third is mostly dark uh it's a lot of hard to watch except for that wrestling match where there's like there's some shots where like one of the droogs is spinning their hands around, yeah. not even yeah. hitting the guy. Yeah. And it's ridiculous. It is. It's it's unbelievable how much this whiplash is around. And I don't know, like some of the scenes, like the writer, even after he figures out who Alex is at that dinner, it's so over the top. He's way and David Prowse, yeah. aka Darth Vader, in case you didn't know, like that <laughs> big guy. That's <laughs> Darth Vader. Wow. That, that, uh, not the voice, obviously, but the right, body. the body. Huh? I did not know that. Um, Patrick yeah. McGee, a, a staple of Kubrick, um, and that's I. And yeah, Kubrick does tend to over. I mean, even that first shot. I mean, that that leer that that McDowell has. It, he does the same thing in Full Metal Jacket with Vincent D'Onofrio's character. Like he. Oh, he doesn't know. He, he's movies. he's all uh, about that kind. He Nicholson he will, does it in The Shining. Oh, absolutely. It's 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 kind of his kind of his thing. I think um, there's a page called like the Kubrick stare yeah, on some website, I like think it's TV probably, tropes like or something. Tumblr or yeah. something. It's like um, a thousand yard stare. It's weird. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, um, uh, that's the full metal jacket before. Uh, yeah. Denop you mentioned Denopia. Yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. So, I mean, it's, I think that that is Kubrick's kind of tendency to kind of, when he's got something in mind, he does tend to over direct, but it does seem like at least with this movie, uh, even the art director said like, we kind of just kind of hobbled together Alex and the Drew's outfits. Uh, it was more or less an accident, the eyelash thing, but Kubrick sure. saw it and said, stuff fucking car. bingo, we got it. Um, but, and then they found the hat and, and uh, there was some somebody, because Kubrick resided and lived in England most of his life, but he was American. So, but when he put on the bolo hat onto Alex, a lot of people around him said that like, if you put a bolo hat on this monster, this country is gonna go crazy because this is supposed to be the symbol of respectability and dignity. And if you put a bolo hat on this guy, they are gonna lose it. So that's why I I, I kind of don't buy that Kubrick was taken aback by how shocked everybody was by this movie. Seems like you were kind of doing it on purpose there, big guy. Seems like well, uh, that was kind of the I, idea. I wouldn't be surprised by that either. I, I, I will also say, even in that first third, um, which obviously I said is like the most shocking segment, like there are the scene with deltoid is so ridiculous it's fucking absurd the way he speaks is nonsense <laughs> um i even like the victim the the female victim she speaks in like the king's english like what are you doing here oh my you little ruffian um what, and, quick, and and quick and that's out, quick shout out to deltoid that's aubrey morris uh he's the same guy who plays the um groundskeeper in the wicker man Oh, oh nice. god damn cool the, cool i actually like deltoid i thought the that, parents, I, mean, I, I think it. the parents of the first third who are so fucking stupid and oblivious one of them is grady from the shining i noticed yeah the dad, he, he used him in the uh, eyes wide shot too he's a Cooper. um Cooper. and and that ridiculous fucking sped up sexy to like is it the william tell overture yep mm -hmm. yep 
Yep. Like, yeah, yeah, that's it. it all this movie it, really it, bounces he, in tone. When he's it's, drugged, it's amazing. It works. When he's drugged, I mean, he just falls flat. His face just falls flat in the spaghetti. When I watched it, it was uh, when I watched it when I was a kid. That was odd. When I watch it now, that's fucking hilarious. I'm like, <laughs> um, so it, it it is weird how this movie has kind of evolved in the audience, but it's still the same hellish nightmare that it was i think originally yeah, intended i just can't believe how it is it, it is so remarkable. many things at once it, it it is a sign of of kubrick being a master in my opinion i mean it is because you know when you shoot it like a dark comedy but yet you edit it like a horror movie and especially i we've got to talk about wendy carlos's score uh mm -hmm. because that in and of itself was a pioneering thing using a moog synthesizer and i think even the the way i mean that first the, the theme to a clockwork orange which is basically a, a synthesized version of the funeral for queen mary or whatever it, it the music fits the theme of the title which is a clockwork orange burgess goes at length because everybody always asks him what the title meant he just took it as some cockney slang and, and kind of went with it but he also liked the title because it's the juxtaposition of something beautiful and organic and natural like an orange and then putting it something next to something cold and mechanic yeah and my understanding like was work. it's like um it's making it's taking an organic thing and putting and making it mechanical so right. what they do to alex is he is an organic person yeah and they remove his choice and turn him into to a robot, a robot. as burgess but but i mean the, but the music sort of does the same thing doesn't it, it takes these what you would feel is like just natural divine music rammed through this computer generator and the sound that it makes i think does more to serve this movie's theme and tone than anything else in it because but, it is that theme and you hear the and you're like what am i getting yeah, into i think it's also reused in uh the shining like i think that's the intro music when they're doing the Don't fly so. in at the uh, during the title sequence, that's the, not true. Wah, that's not. Wah, I don't, that's the, wah, the main thing. That is the that's Tangerine Dream. That's a it's the same idea, but it's a different song. Yeah, uh, I don't okay. think it's the same song. Okay, it is. A, I, I promise it's a different song. But I mean, Kubrick did like uh, to use classical music for fucking everything. But um, uh, well, first, um, you know what? I think that's uh, an interestingly observed point. Uh, I think I'll give Russell a point for that uh, sort of. Uh, hey. Confluence, um, but yeah, uh, uh, unfortunately, uh, while I was saying that, I forgot where I was going, so we could continue ah. the conversation. Well, yeah, that's why. I mean, like you know, it, it, and it, it. I think it's a, a lot that is lost on uh, the laurels that this movie still has, as far as where it stands in cinema history. I hope and pray that Wendy Carlos isn't lost in that, because what she did was remarkable. Um, and and I think it it makes the movie just as much as Malcolm McDowell does. Oh, um, yeah, uh, I remember now. Um, Nadsat as a mm, concept. Mm, um, mm. That is, I think, very striking. Like the the way in which it's weird, but just understandable enough. And as the film goes on, because constantly the narration is in nadsat you begin to understand more and more of it but you're never lost completely even at the beginning you understand enough uh to like infer meaning i think that the so and i i, I mean i'm sure a lot of that is straight from the novel but i actually think it i'm surprised by how well it works for like a completely uh theoretically like if a nor if you walked into a bar and people were speaking like this right it would be inscrutable but they do it in a, a very skillful way that i think like allows you enough understanding and slowly increasing understanding that the that it is not uh it does not make it so the movie is impossible to understand and i, I, I think mean, that the very you, well very well done do you think it's because they give you context uh at lower levels like when they introduce it he's introducing his droogs and things like that so you're like okay this is i'm friends. sure i'm sure it's part of it that probably yeah. does help but also but it, it is, does kind of force you to kind of do that much yeah. work out what like what the fuck is a gulliver you know like that kind of stuff and and again uh, i i burgess to his credit the reason why he i mean that's what makes the book basically unreadable is is all that nad sad stuff and it's true I, it probably I, helps I'm to have the visual fan. indications yeah, yeah. I, I i 
read it when I was really young, when I was really into this movie. So I read the book with the last chapter and everything, and I was horribly disappointed. Um, it, 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 it was a lot of looking back to the glossary. But I mean, you know, the, from what I understand it, you know, uh, they pretty much, everybody walked around with this book as if it was a fucking Bible. So they, they seem to have a pretty firm grasp of the lingo. And what I like about Anthony Burgess is one of the reasons why he said he did it is to not date it, to, to kind of keep it, Mm. removed and i think that was very smart i think that's smart i mean orwell kind of did the same thing with you know double speak and what have you um i mean it, it's yeah. cribbing from orwell i mean even burgess admits this it's it's, it's a dystopian orwell even, kind uh, of was the the staple there's a few there's a few movies like mad max sure. fury road has a bit of a sure. like its own i'll even and... i'll even give you a more recent one i mean the closest movie that i've seen try to do this movie is joker and didn't do it well um, uh, there's I think also that... uh, a classic example of doing it really terribly. Um, if you guys remember the show Firefly, uh, the constant oh, yeah. use of Chinese and shiny and slang that they invented for that movie. If you hear mm -hmm. people talk about that now, or if you try to watch an episode now, it's really painful because they keep using extremely I at least, goofy I kind of... words. I'm okay with that more than I am with something than say like the the reincarnation of Battlestar Galactica yeah, where they just I, substituted I, nonsense for swear words. I'm like just yeah, I, a I'm swear more. Word. I saw my dad rewatched Firefly recently while I was in Colorado and I watched some with him. The Chinese stuff is fine to me. The idea that that there's a hybridization of Chinese and American or English, I should say. Right. Um, and Burgess is kind of doing the same thing with well, the Soviet Union. There's a logic you know. to it, at least. Yeah. I mean, you, Burgess is assuming. And it's a clever thing. It's a better workaround than what they do in Battlestar Galactic. Yeah. I just think that's just like, we want to swear, but we can't. So we're going to yeah. make up swear words. I think so that swearing right. in Chinese is like, yeah, fine. Uh, you want to have your character <laughs> swear. It's the future. China and America became one thing. Fuck it. Sure. I swear in Chinese. That's <laughs> that's not a bad word around to me. That makes a logical sense at least. <laughs> um yeah, no, so that's why I, I, I think that uh in, in this movie, the the NADSAT, the lingo, I mean I it, I still don't understand what most of it means, but at least again, I think the it's way like, of the way Malcolm McDowell portrays it and the way they kind of keep it going with the narration, it kind of as a you kind of just it's like reading uh it's like reading a really dense fantasy or watching the wire when you first start watching the wire. Sure. Trying to understand who all these characters are and how they relate at first is pretty daunting. But as you get used to it, you'll start to get it. You know, like uh, you Yeah. The Briefly, just to go back to the previous point about Firefly, it actually reminds me of, have you ever watched a Japanese thing that is uh, subtitled or like a song? Yep. There yeah. are snippets of English in that shit. Hmm. Like every once in a while, you'll hear, like if you watch Battle Royale, like they just say very cool in English sometimes. Like that shit, I don't think it's that crazy. I think it kind of works. Yeah, they do the same some in German too. Although I think "good" is a German word as well as an English word. Um, but yeah, that's why I, I it's it's it 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 carries because that's why it's weird that Kubrick gets writing credit. I mean, he wrote it in a way, but from what I understand, he was just kind of going for the hip. And it's not something you typically would understand from Kubrick. Again, I think this was his. I think he was kind of upset about that the hype that 2001 got and didn't get nobody got the jokes inside of. 2001 there are plenty if you rewatch it again there's a lot of humor in that movie the bathroom um, in the space yeah. station yeah yeah it's it's funny um so i think he was pissed off mm. about that so i said he said you know what i'm gonna make a joke that nobody's gonna understand and in the end the joke's on you um and that's why i thought well i compared i i kind of went off about it with sarah earlier about like watching movies like a clockwork orange or like taxi driver remind me why i didn't really care for joaquin phoenix as the joker um at least we with say a, todd phillips the joker to yeah be that's true yeah <laughs> credit well, no, credit that movie was made the only movie that movie works is because of joaquin phoenix i don't give a yeah, shit about joaquin phillips. phoenix is not the problem with that yeah, film no, is what he's I mean. no well i just i joaquin phoenix is the joker um i think what this that actually does glorify violence and glorify the bad guy you know, by the end of it, you feel bad that he became a bad guy, but by the end of it, he's just dancing on top of a cop car and everybody's his friend and you're, you're his friend too. With this one, it takes you on a journey and then you realize that like, oh, you've been had. Well, this one definitely you know, I was cured it. all right, sucker. Well, it handles it better than uh, Malcolm McDowell's like 
follow-up films like Caligula, which essentially... Yeah, was, right, yeah. He was right. just playing Alex again, but as Caligula. I know. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and yeah, if you me. thought the nudity was a lot in this movie, boy, howdy. Wait till you get the guy poor, from... Poor um, old McDowell. He Pet did not... Uh, he never he never recaptured the, the Clockwork Orange. He never... Oh, and he, it's a shame. He went too. on to that... Uh, he, yeah, I, I don't know. Like, I, he, his, his, like, Caligula and some of his other future work, like, um, future at the time this was made, like mm. the Rob Zombie Halloweens mm. are yeah. shallow violence and shallow nudity in a way this isn't. And I'm wondering, like, do you How understand the, oh, the movie you were fucking in? Yeah. Or did you just right. think, like, shocking equal good? Well, yeah. I mean, is it him or was it, like, typecasting? Because, I mean, this was, like, a Could huge be both. You're right. cultural True. thing. And he played villains a lot. Like, even in, mm -hmm. I think, Star Trek Generations of all things. Yep, they you had bet. him being mm -hmm. the main villain. And he He's got just, such a good voice yeah. and face for it. You know, it's yeah. a lot like Christopher Lee. You know, like, Christopher Lee is, like... You, you you can play him as a good guy, but he nails it as a bad guy. Um, yeah. You know, and that's I think Malcolm McDowell is kind of the same way. Um, well, I'm sure now that I've said that next year, he'll be in like the best movie of the summer right. next yeah. year. Yeah. Like it'll right. be like McDowell's back after 50 years. Right. He's yeah. 70. They'll put him in a Marvel movie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's why it's so weird that this movie is 50 years old. I mean, that's yeah. what makes a lot of the aspects of this movie pretty remarkable that a the time of which it happened early you know like there blade runner cribs from this movie you know like there's so many movies that kind of crib from the style of oh, a clockwork man. orange there's Space a lot Jam. of great little production design stuff in oh this. yeah it's, i mean even the the movie the record store. music it's it's it is so for that to have such staying power and for it to be more or less a lark on Kubrick's thinking because he again this was a low budget thing for him he wanted to prove to everyone that he can do it after the massive budget of 2001 to kind of scale it back and I think that that served we were talking about this with Reservoir Dogs that like it, that Tarantino worked better under constraint and I think that this was Kubrick putting constraints on himself and just to see if he could do it and I give him props I mean immediately after he went on and did Barry Lyndon so it's not yeah. like he's like you know I, fuck this I'll just throw some money I, I don't necessarily think Kubrick works better under constraint i think kubrick knows how to how to use a budget pretty i think good. he could do it i think he could pretty you can get him any budget and he'll make it work i think yeah. it's just that kind of director and he's just one of those directors you know like it obviously not all of his movies land um and but and this was the movie that kind of was the turning point that i think turned people off of kubrick uh, people, because yeah. like I think like he had he was on such a trajectory from Paths of Glory to Spartacus to Doctor Strange Love to 2001 and then he does this movie. Well, and, I mean, hold hold on, Full Metal Jacket comes out after that and completely like that's right. parts of the culture Full Metal again. Jack, but that was quite a bit later. Yeah. That was in the 80s. Yeah, and and for sure. you know The Shining, you know, say what you will, The Shining was 10 years after the well, sure. almost 10 years after this, and and that's debatably his most famous film. I think 2001 is probably his most famous, if I had to guess. There's if contenders. I guess. Yeah, I mean, obviously. Uh, in terms of in terms of the most parodied, like, you know, like you could you could make an argument for you could make an argument for this. Yeah, you could make an argument so for 2001 really, or yeah. The Shining. Yeah, probably not I, so much Lolita. Um, yeah, probably not. Except for Pedro Sellers' character, I guess performance. I should say, not his character. Um, but that one. Um, the, yeah, that and even Kubrick caught a lot of shit for that too. So it's not like he was a stranger to controversy, that, you know. Uh, I, my, I have not, I have not seen Kubrick's Lolita. I heard it's one of his worst movies, and I've also heard, I have read, um, the novel Lolita, and in comparison to The Shining or my understanding of Clockwork Orange, like that is a work of pretty pure fucking genius that I think he might have. Over, overreached yeah like i, I don't think, he, think i don't think it, um, uh the thing the is, off, is, like i don't think you can really the, make it better or like do your own vision like that novel yeah. i mean the even, movie you know, I mean, it's a different people movie, misinterpret that little is a different topic yeah it's a different topic but it's also like that movie over sexualizes that kid um and and the novel does not yeah the novel is really like beautifully written like yeah. one of the most beautifully written novels ever it's from the perspective of humbert humbert and if you are a sharp reader it's clear 
it's clear what's going on. And then there's this perpetual myth that Lolita like coaxes Humbert Humbert. No, 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 no. You read that book. That is not what is fucking going on in that story. This is a man justifying his own actions. I don't know. It, it bothers me that people misinterpret low and 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 the author specifically said i don't want any young bodies on the cover of this book i don't want young people i don't want a young face i don't want a young figure no. i don't want a woman's figure that is not what i want on the cover of my book now that was obviously like yeah that was the marketing when they did the movie yeah. like that was the, that was on the For problems sure. like the heart-shaped sucker that was something that i think uh wasn't in the movie that was in or the heart-shaped glasses that mm -hmm. wasn't yeah. in the movie that was at a press junket that she put those on and then they use that for the marketing for the poster so yeah not good yeah and and again but it's the the movie itself is still pretty good i mean as far as kubrick goes it's still a pretty watchable you know jay i mean mason's really good and so is peter sellers and and but i mean there are other there are other kubrick movies that are way way better i would even say this movie is a thousand times better this movie's in his top three in my maybe opinion. one day we'll talk about uh, uh we'll talk uh, we'll, about we'll that movie and yeah. um, um we'll but see. a clockwork it's, orange is yeah, i have I'll, a lot I'll, of fondness for that novel mm. and the adaptations that i'm aware of are like not not my favorite wasn't Jeremy Irons in an adaptation? Yeah, there was Dom Dominique, yeah. Dominique Swain and one of her only jobs that everyone knows about. I don't know. That was the actress yeah, okay. who played huh. Lolita in the uh, Jeremy Irons. Jeremy Irons, Irons, if you are interested in the novel, uh, rather than watch that um, adaptation, if you have an Audible subscription, Jeremy Irons does the audio book. Oh, that's cool. Oh. Lolita. That is uh, cool. My my girlfriend says it's one of her favorite audio books. Okay, that's that, I'll take that. Certainly can take her word for it on that one, uh, especially yeah. the chair Arts. All right, well I guess uh, we've kind of run out of steam on a Clockwork Orange. We got business to attend to, uh, unless that's you guys true. have something else to talk about. Um, but yeah, I guess I'll I'll, yeah, we I'll wrap up what I just final I, I thought it real quick. Yeah, let me get. Uh, I think that this movie, if you haven't seen this movie and you've got the stomach for it, uh, it's worth your time to at least see it once. It's like one of those movies that it, if you see it once, you pretty much got it. Um, but revisiting again, I I was taken aback by how much it still affects me and how you're still in awe of it, uh, of Alex and Malcolm McDowell and the stylization of it and the fucking soundtrack is rules, but also the, the philosophy behind it, you know, that sure. human nature might actually, it's, it's the Hobbesian approach that human nature is actually pretty bad. Um, and it, this movie is kind of forcing the audience to bring out your own bad nature. Um, and that's powerful and that's hard to replicate and hard to do well. And Kubrick managed to do it almost by accident. Um, and I think that's one of the staying powers of this movie. Uh, I really liked it when I was a kid because, you know, if you think about it, cause this even predates like the punk rock movement, 1971, like, and that didn't come around to the eighties. And there was a lot more of these kind of street gang violent stuff in the eighties. Um, so this movie kind of predates that kind of, and, and as a kid, as a 14 year old, you know, snot nose, punk that i was you know who would like death metal and horror movies and all that this movie affected me because i was like oh right you know uh, alex is actually a terrible person and there's nothing that should be idolized about what he's doing however it is okay to understand that what he's going through towards the end of the movie uh is not acceptable either and that's the kind of that's the 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 trick it plays on you and kubrick's uh kubrick's a master uh I'll jump in next. Um, here's here's a telling thing about this movie, I think. Um, I disagree with a number of things Russell just said. Um, I think there's value in watching this movie again. Uh, I I saw it when I was younger. I didn't, there's so much more that I either forgot or didn't get the first time um, about so much of the nature of like what this movie is trying to say, it's tone uh, jokes that I likely never understood. And if I watched it again, I bet I would see even more. I, I, I think it's very likely I would. Um, and I also think that um, it's not Hobbesian. I think it's in very many ways the opposite because this is saying You're getting a point, Zach. I'm giving you a point for that because I knew I, I knew as soon as I mentioned anything philosophy, I knew that Zach would jump all over it. So you're this getting a point is not, for me, buddy. 
this is not Hobbes like idea of like, we need a strong man government to come down on us. No, 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 this refutes that. Alex is the cost of free will, but it's a cost worth keeping. I think this movie very much is opposed to the viewpoint of, you know, free will is a bad thing. Free will is, is necessity, even if it comes with the cost of, of a delinquent, like this little piece of shit. Um, yeah, no, uh, I look, I, I completely, I, I, I just took it watching it this time. It was striking to me how cynical it is about free will and human nature. Like it, it is pretty cynical about it. I mean, the free will thing is because of the drug, but also like his free will is to be a monster. That is his free will. I I just think, you know, like it's a movie where they particular, they make a point of spending 30 minutes making the worst fucking person you've ever seen. And then saying, even this guy deserves to choose. Uh Um, Yeah, but uh, that's about it. I I think it's really great. I think that there's uh, a lot of dimensions to it, the way the tone shifts and it works the the things that inspired in film going forward the references to it like this is it's you know it's a classic it's a masterpiece i like it movie yeah that's way movie. more than i did uh when i saw it when i was younger uh oh, that's about man. it um in my case i think uh re-watching it it occurs to me that it is easier to watch this if you don't focus as intensely as I was required to in high school on the science of behavioralism (laughs) because uh, there's a lot more going on in the story and it's also that like when you focus on stuff like that it kind of misses the point of the story due to the fact that you wind up pulling apart things and they'll ask questions like what doesn't work and what does work and you're like well okay so taste aversion is a real thing but people don't have taste aversion to the things they see (laughs) And PTSD I suspect the degree can, to which this uh, technique is based in yeah. real science is pretty uh, slim. Yeah, it is. But it was one of those things that, like, they just were reaching and trying to connect with kids to get them interested in psychology in high school. Uh, that wow. class had all sorts of weird issues. To watch this, to watch this movie in an academic sense outside of filmmaking seems to be a chore. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like, it, it, it wasn't. It was work. not a good time i think they did it because they knew a lot of kids were into it and a lot of kids had the poster so they're like oh we're gonna this get will shut them up yeah um yeah. <laughs> uh i think uh the violence in it um and the sex in it it's the first time i remembered being a kid because i saw a clip of this before i actually saw it in high school and i remember being like really offended or i was like oh why would anyone watch a movie with someone who is that mean to people uh but i was like flipping through channels I think it was like 10 when I first saw a clip of this and it was the uh, opening sequence where uh, like the two gangs were fighting and I saw Mm. that they were attacking a lady and I was immediately like oh god why would anyone watch this so for years I didn't understand and then when I finally saw it it you know I had the sense of gray for good and bad and an anti-hero and I could comprehend the concept that someone could be an absolute monster and still be the main character and you could still root for them, even though, even though they're a monster. Uh, right. Rooting got, for him creates it, b- brings yeah. him back to being a monster. Yeah. And it's weird because this also, like, it echoes through the culture. Like, you have, like, Hannibal Lecter. You have all these anti-heroes that became super popular later. Like, even Travis Bickle and Taxi Driver. Taxi Driver, for sure. Um, and the uh, yeah, most recent example I can it's... think of, which has... Uh, various levels of merit Uh, Dexter Uh, Hmm. he's a guy who spends the entire time killing people and being a disgusting monster however it's also got that whole uh, latter era uh, Hannibal Lecter thing where they try to do a lot of moralizing where he only kills bad people it's really strange Hmm. Um, but uh, this one's being released on 4k so I'm probably going to wind up seeing hey all right 50th anniversary way to go all righty yeah that's awesome Uh, I'll say I think at this point, um, especially post in the uh, years post Tony Soprano, the white male broken like anti-hero character uh, is almost an epidemic that has mm-hmm. gone a little out of control. Um, you yeah. know, you got your Walter Whites, even like fucking Rick and Morty at this point. It's like. Mm. You know, yeah. mm-hmm. it's got a little it's we could calm down with it. Right. I, I'll give I'll give Clockwork Orange credit. A lot of the stuff that seems so tired now. They were doing it before anybody else was. Yep. Yep. 
it's yep. a Gen X vibe film, definitely. Like I could see oh, this affecting sure. Gen X and being one of the causes of that whole cultural movement. Mm, for sure. Yeah. Cool. Alrighty. Well, this has been a fun theme, actually, Zach. Uh, I, I it, like this has been actually a, a tough uh, gamut of movies to vote against. Well, you know, because I, 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 had a, quality. I had a great idea for my next theme, but I somewhat suspect I'm not going to be able to pick this time. Uh, yeah, um, I mean, like, and, and it's uh, not like you pick the softy either. I mean, like, I, oh, no, I, no, no. I, you know, like, so this has been a this has been a rewarding theme, I think, um, just because of the, the quality of movies we watch on, like, you know, Police mm -hmm. Academy or Howard the Duck or whatever. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, uh, yeah so reach, I reach for the back shelves. Is yeah, there nice you go. <laughs> um, All righty. So before we get in the final voting gents here we go with the point count oh, uh no. i have 12 points uh because i got one from zach about the music thing chris you got 14 points you running the way with it and zach you now have 13 points for disagreeing with me about the hobbesian thing because i pretty much laid oh, that out as perfect bait. Um, okay all righty so let's get to the voting of who won this theme and then we will get to the business okay, of 13. our halloween all right. okay chris boroff what do you got for reservoir dogs I had to give Reservoir Dogs a three because of math. I like the film, <laughs> I but know. I give it a three. I know. Mm. Uh, I as well had to give Reservoir Dogs a three, partially because of math, but also partially because uh, I think we kind of let Quentin Tarantino off the hook a little bit in that episode about his blatant use of racism and homophobia. Sure. Um, and whereas you think of other movies that are his contemporaries, like the Coen brothers, why don't they ever have that problem? Isn't that funny how they never seem to have that problem? Hmm. Anyway, uh, Zach Powers, what do you got for Reservoir Dogs? Tragically, because of math, I had to give Reservoir Dogs a three. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. That is nine points for Reservoir Dogs. Uh, and now we're at uh, the surprise uh, hit, I would believe, of this theme, uh, which is Chris Boroff's pick of Sorcerer. Chris Boroff, what are you given Sorcerer? I have given Sorcerer a five. Uh, additionally, because of math. But sure. yes, there we go. Yeah. Alrighty, uh, I as well gave Sorcerer a five. That was uh, a, a very surprising movie that I foolishly and stupidly <laughs> belied for that I uh, maligned for no good reason other than my own ignorance so I owe it to this movie to give it a high uh -oh. ranking because that movie ruled I am sensing a problem here I gave <laughs> Sorcerer a uh -oh. five uh oh <laughs> uh oh alright well that puts Reservoir Dogs out of the opening and okay well let's but we have another problem we have a <laughs> different problem okay. <laughs> if oh, my boy. math is right we have uh, oh boy <laughs> okay well an issue alright uh, Chris Borif what do you got for uh, a Clockwork Orange I got a 6 for Clockwork Orange okay because uh, it honestly was something that I was a bigger fan of when I was younger. Uh, Sorcerer was a surprise hit, but Zach, what, I, yeah, I am now seeing what uh, the problem is going to be. Uh, <laughs> uh, because I gave Clockwork Orange a four, and again, that's mainly because hmm. of math. I, I, uh, <laughs> I and, happen uh, uh, right. to at this point have five <laughs> points left. I couldn't decide between Sorcerer and Clockwork Orange, so I went ahead and gave it a five. Okay. Which brings its total to 15. 15, and we are mistaken. tied once again. Sorcerer and A Clockwork Orange are tied. Okay, so I think in the element of a tie, because Zach's movie is out and it's now just Borf and I's movie, I think, Zach, you get to be the tiebreaker. <laughs> I gave them the same score. Exactly. Time to get off the fence, brother. All right. I got it. Okay. I think, friendship's worth I think, more to you. <laughs> <laughs> you know... <laughs> I I really briefly I really appreciated Sorcerer because it was an undiscovered masterpiece that I missed I never saw it it was lost in the 70s shuffle somehow and I was like oh this movie's really good and fun and great and I, I can't believe I never uh, heard anything about it it was it was a surprise Clockwork Orange is different it's uh, a movie that everybody knows it's incredibly well known but the fact of the matter is, if I remove, if I try to make it look at it from a purely logical standpoint, A Clockwork Orange is the stronger uh, of the two. If I remove my personal um, mm -hmm. personal bias, of being, a personal thing of being like, this was just such a fun surprise. I didn't expect much going in and just look at them objectively as films. I think 
Clockwork Orange. What can you say? Yeah. Tough but it's, fair. Tough yeah. but fair. fair. I, I, yeah. I mean, because I, I'm not gonna lie. Were I in your position, I would have given it to Sorcerer, uh, just because it was such a surprise to me, and that movie is right up my alley. But okay. well, I'm not gonna take it. I'm not. I'm not gonna disagree with you because honestly, a Clockwork Orange is amazing. So um, plus, I'll take the win. Russell uh, hasn't picked a theme in at least That's a couple true. rounds. That's true. So it's been a couple. It's, he's well, due. Been, he's due. I am. I am. And this time, my wife didn't do it for me. Ha <laughs> ha. Um, yeah. So, uh, okay, I, I, I've got a theme in the popper if you guys want to hear it before we get to the Halloween stuff. Um, and just to get you thinking. About you know what? It. Who gives a shit? Let's let's give our um, our, our listeners a little tease for what yeah, to expect. Huh? After, It'll be after, after the Halloween and the victory lap. Spoiler um, alert. We spoiler might have something alert. special coming up before this next theme. Right. Um, so, As we did last year. Yeah, right. You know, <laughs> if, you, if you're a long time listener to the show, you know what's coming. Um, so I, knowing you two like I do, I know that you guys love yourselves some sports. Oh, uh, yes. I course. know you're huge, huge sports fans. So right. I've decided to do sports movies. And I'm going to open with one of my favorites that has not aged well at all, and that is Slapshot. Okay. Uh, the well, Paul Newman film. Funny. We'll see that in about funny. two months. Yeah. 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 <laughs> oh, did you go? Know, you actually write that? <laughs> yeah, immediately. I wrote down the word Slapshot, and I'm like, he's going to say this in 10 seconds. <laughs> Yeah, okay. yeah, that's right. Yeah, I think yeah. I, I think I can pull. Borf, have you been I, doing a movie podcast with me for over ten years? I, I'm, I'm shocked that I. That... I, I, I not a bad. This is okay. This is. I'm gonna. I I know uh, what I want to pick. Uh, I'm after you. Chris goes yep. last. That's so, right. cool. um, there's a movie I've been meaning to see, never got around to. I know what I'm gonna do. But but I know what it that's, is. That's that's for a later time. Cool. Um, we are in the right sp- now. Right now. It is time the to leaves, get spooky. The leaves be changing, gentlemen. That's right. Chains is rattling in your house. <laughs> Ghosts <laughs> are around us. Spookins it's scary. Mm, the time scary. is scary. <laughs> <laughs> it's the scary time. <laughs> so we have to do, uh, uh, per law, uh, our, our spooktacular end of, uh, season. Um, we have a list here. I got 20 potential spooky uh, spooky things we can choose from. Before we get into that, I'm going to actually roll first to see who's going to go first in the choosing order. Okay. I got a six-sided dice here. Now, if I get a one or a two, Chris, you're going to be the first to choose. If I get a three or four, Russell, that's you. And per alphabetical rules, if I get a five or a six, that's me. So let's just see real quick. Chris is going to select the first movie this year. <laughs> okay. Now we got 20, 20 potential uh, options here. I replaced from last year horror classics, which were movies from 1960 to 1979. I'll rotate it back in next year or the year after or something. We'll see. Yeah, we never um, left the seventies. <laughs> yeah. There's still plenty of horror classics we can choose. Um, one is going to be Paranormal Activity, which is Ghosts, Hauntings, and Possessions. Two, Inhuman Enemy, Monsters, Mutants, and Killer Animals. Three, Human Monsters, Serial Killers, or any other human horror villain. Four, Sci-Fi Horror, Robots, Aliens, Experiments. Five, From Hell, Satan, Hell, Demons, The Antichrist. Six, Diseases and Plagues. That's uh, anything that's just general sickness, but also zombieism, vampirism, alien infections, werewolves, anything that could be transmitted like a disease. Seven is European horror. Eight is Asian horror. Nine is the occult. Cults, curses, covens, witches, that sort of thing. Ten is horror comedies. Eleven is slashers or proto-slashers or gayo or whatever you want to do. Twelve is the kids aren't all right. That's creepy or evil children or teens. Uh, 13 is the gross stuff. That's body horror or gore. Um, 14 is don't mind if I do madness or psychological (laughs) horror. 15 horror adaptations, anything adapted from anything, books, short stories, comics, games, TV, doesn't matter. Adaptations. 
16, seasonal affective disorder set on or around Halloween. Hmm. 17 is early horror, 1959 and earlier. 18, replacing the horror classics, it happened again, horror sequels. 19, the pulp horror era, that's 1980 to 1999. And 20 is modern horror, anything in the 21st century. So now we're going to roll. I got a 17. That's early, early horror. horror. Wow. 1959 wow. and earlier. 1959 okay. and earlier. That's wow. going to be an interesting. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Okay. That will be interesting early to see what, I, uh, what we can come up with. Yeah, because it... Um, Wow, I don't have one in mind right now. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm I don't actually, either. I have to I'm, think about it. I'm, I'm going, genuinely going to have to think about it. I'm legitimately confused. Um, well, I guess I'm going to have to come up with something and then record it and then plug it in after the fact or something to that effect. Uh, I, so if our podcast, Phantasm. if our podcast has a bias towards recency, and sometimes it does, but not always. Uh, this will at least correct us for one round. <laughs> yeah. <Sure. laughs> All right. Cool. All righty. All righty. Uh -huh. So the rules of this Halloween theme are we're going to go through basically like a normal movie trap round where we're each going to pick movies based off this theme. And then at the end of it, we're still going to vote and anything. But unlike picking a theme, we will then pick a reward movie that the winner gets to choose whatever movie they want. They are get full reins of the movie trap. They get to trap us in whatever they want for whatever reason. If you'll remember from last year, it was a doozy that Bora played on us. Uh -huh. um, so uh, I guess with that in mind, uh, let's... Uh, Get over to the milk bar and get ready for the old ultra violence. And no, this will be fun. I'll, I'm, I'm excited to watch some uh, black and white movies with my girlfriend. I don't think she'll find anything too objectionable no. in these early, uh, early picks. Uh, no, that's, so it's like anything a great way before to spend 1959. So we can go to like you know, mm -hmm. Nosferatu if we want to. Oh, absolutely. Cool. Mm -hmm. Cool. Right. Un Shane on the loo, if you <laughs> God, no. Oh, God. No. Boris, if you do that, I swear. I'm going to lose No, I mean, it'll just be the uh, the first Frankenstein but, but film. The Universal, oh, yeah. The yeah, Universal yeah, movies. Yep, yep, mm -hmm. yeah. Those mm -hmm. definitely fall into the th theme. And, yeah. and uh, there's some castle horror movies that came a little later. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's, it's kind of silly. Yep. Yeah, yeah uh, it could be some Shirley Jackson, Jackson novels, maybe. Too. But we'll have to mm -hmm. see yeah. what the time is. Get Bert I. Gordon. Get some of that. <laughs> it's be interesting. It'll be interesting. I'm I'm curious about your picks. We'll uh, slot in Chris's. We'll say here. Yeah. Curse of the Cat People. Okay. And on that note, uh, please uh, join us next time for our spooky movie trap theme. Uh, it has been a lot of fun, guys, and I can't wait to get started into the scary stuff. Uh, right. I have been Russell Carlson, and for my co-host, Chris Boroff. Korova is cow in Russian. <laughs> and for my other co-host, Zach Bowers. Uh, Apollology, Duber, Dubovachka, whatever. Eggy wigs. <laughs> All righty. And as we say, never forget here, as we say in the movie trap, Diane Ladd is too young to play Chevy Chase's mom. That's the movie trap promise. At this Tommy Bass chase, everyone from the place. <laughs>